All right, hello. In this video, we're going to be talking about what the kinematic equations of motion are and how to use them. And we'll look at a basic problem solving template and go through an example. Right. Well, before we get started, I'll show you today's t shirt. Oh, stand back. I'm going to do signs. All right. So, sorry, it's a little hard to see there, but get the idea. All right. So a reminder about some of our notation. Uh, we talked before about how delta T can get simplified down to just T. When we see delta, it's always final minus initial. So TF minus T naught, where T naught is zero, and then TF just gets called T. Uh, similarly, on X and V, the F subscript gets dropped. And so it's implied that this is the final position and this is the final velocity. Also, I want to point out that when we're talking about initial and final, there, th this could correspond to different segments within the motion um, because it's, it's often handy or even necessary to do that to be able to solve. So what we pick as initial and final can change from one part of the problem to another as we're going through. All right, uh, so now's a good time to pause the video and take a look at your PHY 111 equation sheet. Um, and notice right at the top of the first page, there's a section labeled uniformly accelerated motion. So that's sort of a strange term. All it really means is constant acceleration. Okay, motion with constant acceleration. And so that's the only time you can use those is when the acceleration is constant. Here's something that we presented in an earlier video, the definition of average velocity, which is displacement over time. If we um, also think about that average velocity, well, if we had two velocities and we wanted to find the average of them, we could add them together and divide by two. And so that's what we have here. That's the average of the initial velocity in the X direction and the final velocity in the X direction. Okay, so remember, there's no F here. It's implied that when there's not a naught, that it is final. Okay, so this is average velocity and this is average velocity, so they're equal to each other. And that's one of the equations on your equation sheet. All right. Here's another definition we had earlier, which is average acceleration. And remember, since we're only dealing with uh, time periods where the acceleration is constant, we can also use that to be the uh, instantaneous acceleration. So we change that from average to instantaneous. Um, we change the, the notation a little bit here as I talked about on the first slide today. And we make it for the X direction. And then once we have this, we can do just a little bit of algebra, multiply both sides by T, add V naught X to both sides. And so then we would have V X by itself on the right. And then on the other side, we would have V naught X plus AX times T. Then we could switch the left and right sides. And there you get the second equation on your equation sheet. Now, I could go through a derivation of the last two equations, um, but I'm not gonna take the time to do that. It's a little bit more complicated. It's not overwhelmingly complicated. And if you wanna see it in your textbook, um, the way to find it, look at the equation numbers next to the explanations and things. And if you go to 2.37 to 2.40, then that is for this equation. And then similarly, 2.45, 2.46 for this other equation, which I will point out does not involve time. All right, so that's the four kinematic equations that we're going to be using, all written in the X direction. And now on to our problem solving strategy, our process for doing that. So our problem solving process and our problem solving template go hand in hand. The steps of the problem solving process are listed on the template. And this template, this is something that you can use as you're doing, uh, well, you're gonna be using it as you do problems in the packets throughout the semester. You can use it for expert TA problem solving. Um, you are going to be showing your work and turning that in. So that's a, a, good, a good template to use for those problems. Uh, you're allowed to use it on quizzes if you want. Um, 
So when you get ready for your quiz, you can have your equation sheet, you can have printouts of the problem solving template, the one that's shown right here, and that's that's shared with you uh, in a separate file that you can easily print out as many copies as you want. All right, so let's talk about this process. So, wow, that's a lot of words. Uh, these are also in your uh, packet, um, the student note packet for module two. But really what I want you to do is to not get into executing the plan, trying to just like write down a, a write down something with some numbers and, and solve, or, or even worse, just like looking at the problem with your calculator and multiplying, dividing, whatever, and trying to get the answer. Really, these first two steps, super important. This is where all the physics happens. Step three is really the math part of it. Uh, so we can't skip over the physics. It's a physics class. So take a moment. Uh, when I say a moment, take, take a few minutes, really, to visualize the problem. And this is not just drawing. Um, part of it is drawing a sketch to uh, represent what's going on. But then on the, on the diagram itself, the best place is on the diagram itself to label what the knowns and unknowns are and to fill in the values, to fill in the units, put all of those things in there. Um, know what you're solving for. Identify what the symbol is. There's a place right here symbol of what we're trying to find and the expected sign okay, right there where you can fill that in. Okay, And you can see on this visualization, here's a, here's a sketch and then here is a motion diagram. And this is a series of dots that this is gonna be required for all one dimensional kinematics problems. So all of module two and all of module three, you're gonna to have to draw one of these dot diagrams for each problem, sometimes more than one. Okay, and so the dots are all at equal time intervals. And so if the dots are getting further apart, that means the object is speeding up, okay? So close together, like let's say these were, I don't know, a 10th of a second apart, okay? It went this distance in a 10th of a second. Oh, later on, it's going a greater distance in a 10th of a second. It's, it's going faster than before. And now it's going even, okay? And these things that are in this box, they go with this dot right here. It's not just a list of symbol numbers, but they're in a particular place on the diagram so that these numbers and these symbols go with this dot. And these symbols and these numbers go with this dot. And this one, we're recognizing that we don't know it, but we can still put it on our diagram, okay? Oh, and look, these symbols, these really should be X and VX as opposed to having the F subscripts in there, okay? To go along with what's on your equation sheet and what's in your, your textbook, all right? Um, if it's a yes, no question, you're gonna wanna restate the question. We'll see some examples of these in the module two packet as you go through. And you also wanna be thinking about, you know, what approach are you gonna be using? Is it, well, it's easy right now because you're only studying 1D kinematics, but as you get further into the semester, you'll have more things to choose from because you'll have more chapters that you've already done. Uh, another thing to consider is, do you need to break down the problem into multiple time periods? Okay, Planning the solution, well, it kind of goes with this part right here, identifying the general approach, but then it's getting a little more specific, pulling out particular equations that might be useful. And when you do that, you can write them down in there. You write them down in symbolic form, Okay, like this, and then you can put checks and question marks in there, either above or below the symbol, and that allows you to see how many unknowns there are. Okay, so if you wrote down this equation and you're like, oh, I've got two unknowns, Vx and Ax, so I won't be able to solve that one. And then you write down this one, you say, oh, well, there's only one unknown in that. I can solve that. Plus, one of the unknowns, a sub x, all for it. I can plug it in here, and now this equation will only have one unknown. So that's part of the planning process. What if we had written down the other two equations instead of these? Well, maybe we would be able to solve it that way. That's a possibility. There's often more than one way to solve these kinematics problems. Or we might have gotten stuck and said, oh, well, we don't have enough information. But that doesn't mean we're really stuck. We just write down the other equations 
We just keep going until we get to equations that would work. Okay, so one of the keys for uh, figuring out if your plan is good is do you have as many equations as you do unknowns? If you do that, then it is solvable. Maybe you have the skills to solve it. Maybe you don't. Maybe solving two equations that have two unknowns in each one is, is too difficult for you. I can help you with that. Um, but it is something that's solvable. So that's something where you're like, okay, I've got it. I've got the physics part worked out. Now I just need to, to figure out the math part. Or maybe there's another way to do it where you can get around that. You don't have to solve two equations simultaneously. All right. So that's the first two steps in the solving problem problem solving process. And now we move on to step three, which like I said, that's the math part where you're gonna be solving for the unknowns. Make sure you follow the rules of algebra. You gotta do the same thing to both sides. If there's multiple terms on one of the sides and you're multiplying or dividing, you have to do that to each term. We'll make sure you don't forget about that. Keep your units in there all throughout. And then at the end, you're gonna check and evaluate. Does, does your answer make sense? Is it is a complete solution? Did you answer all of the parts that they wanted? Does the sign of the answer make sense? Does your answer have the right units? Is it about the right size? We talked about approximations in a prior video. Does it make sense? Is it, you know, seem about right? Or does it seem like 100 times too small? Because if it seems 100 times too small or too big, then you really want to check back to see if if you did something wrong. Okay, let's take a look at this for this uh, same problem. We're looking here and and see we already we already talked about down through here, and now they've taken this equation and they're tackling that one first. Like I mentioned, um, oh no, they're actually doing. Sorry, this <laughs> my mistake. I don't know why they switched the left and right here, but anyway, here's the first one they're doing and they're solving for the acceleration. They show units throughout. Zero times something is just going to be zero, so that's why there's a line through it. And then you get an acceleration of 3.2 meters per second squared. It makes sense. The velocity of the airplane is to the right. The acceleration is to the right. So when those are both in the same direction, that means the object is speeding up. And that makes sense. That's what we're doing here. We have an airplane that's speeding up. Once you have that acceleration, you can plug it in over here, and that allows you to find the final velocity. Okay. And again, the symbol is Vx. Uh, the author of particular solution, who is not me, uh, as you might guess, uh, chose to change that to Vf. Um, that's personal. There's, there's lots of different symbols used by different books or different individuals will modify them uh, as they're using them. And that's fine. As long as you know what you're doing, um, there's, there's no problem with that. Okay, is the solution complete? We can read back through the uh, question and we see that it did ask us for the acceleration and final speed. So yes, the signs are correct. Uh, we're Speed is a scalar, so that has to be magnitude. Even if it even if it were negative, we would still have put the the magnitude here for answer for speed. Um, already talked about the sign for that one. We look at the units. We have meters here. We had seconds here, and then we squared it, so that gave us seconds squared, and then we divided, and we got meters per second squared. That is the SI unit for acceleration. And over here, we had meters per second squared times seconds. So this second cancels with one of the seconds in the denominator, leaving us with units of meters per second. So that is also the correct value or the correct unit, the SI unit for velocity and also for speed. All right, so that all makes sense. Uh, are the oh, are the magnitudes reasonable? Uh, hard to say for acceleration. Uh, that's less than one g. So. That makes sense that it's not a gigantic acceleration. Um, certainly you can have military planes that have um, that undergo multiple Gs, meaning multiples of 9.8 meters per second squared. If you're not familiar with that terminology, it's okay. Um, and then a final speed, a takeoff speed of 105 meters per second 
Remember, we can double that to get it to miles per hour. So that's around 200 miles per hour. That's a reasonable speed for an airplane to be going when it takes off. Here's one more example. Uh, this is from your textbook, example 2.12. And so it asks on dry concrete, uh, a car can accelerate at a rate of 7.00 or, or decelerate um, at a rate of 7.0 meters per second squared and on wet concrete, only five meters per second squared. So find the stopping distances for these two different accelerations. And you would expect that the stopping distance is gonna be longer on the wet concrete. So that's one way to evaluate your answer at the end when you get both answers for um, A and B, then you want to make sure B has the higher number. It should be a greater stopping distance. If not, you did something wrong. Uh, let's take a look at what the motion diagram would look like for this. So it's, here's the first dot. Oh, that's not good. Let's erase that. Try again. Okay, there's a dot and it's going fast at first and then slowing down. Oh, I made this kind of difficult on myself. I don't know if I'm going to make it all the way. So they get closer and closer. I don't know. All right. Sorry. I should have made this first one a little bit more spaced out. But there you get the idea. There's it's going fast and then slower, 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 slower. Okay. So that's the motion diagram for that part. But then in part C, it says find the displacement from where the where the driver first sees the traffic light turn red but recognizing that it's gonna take them some amount of time between when they first see it and when their foot hits the brake and they start to actually slow down. So what's happening during that half a second of reaction time? What's the car doing? Well, it's not slowing down. Okay. So that's at a time when it's going at a constant speed. So I'm gonna, draw, I'm gonna expand my motion diagram here. So during this time, oh, this time right here, the speed is constant. And so during that time, the acceleration, forgive the little weird mess ups on the, the writing, the acceleration during this time period is zero. Okay, so during that reaction time, that half a second, there's zero acceleration. 0 0.5 seconds, there's zero acceleration. So that means whatever the speed was here, it's also the speed back here. So that means the velocity is zero here and the velocity is zero here. Uh, to match the equations on the equation sheet, sorry about the goofy pen on this, it's really acting up today. This would be V naught X, okay? And that's the velocity there and there. So it's easy to figure out how far it's gonna go during this time period. That's just constant velocity motion. That's easy, 30 meters per second times half a second. It's gonna go 15 meters during that time period. And then we can analyze this time period. Well, we already have analyzed that time period. And so it's just this additional amount. So, all right. Well, that gave you two examples uh, to think about. And then in your uh, the rest of the student note packet, uh, there are lots of other videos where there are solutions worked out. Remember, try them on your own, do the best you possibly can before you watch the video. And if you do need to watch the video, try to just watch part of it until you get to a point where you're like, oh, I didn't think of that. Or I see where they're going with this. Pause the video and try it on your own. Uh, you're gonna be a lot better off the more of it you do on your own and the less you copy from the videos, the more practice you're gonna get. And that's what's gonna get you ready for the quizzes. That's what builds up your ability to do the problems. Remember, you don't get better at basketball or football or sewing by watching other people do it. You get better at those things by doing them yourselves. 
All right, that's it. Remember, I'm here to help you. Just reach out to me and I'm happy to help you with whatever you need.